Hey guys, what's up? It's Alex over at Laser Everything, and welcome to the 19th episode of the Lightburn for Galvo Crash Course. In this episode, we were supposed to be talking about the Laser Tools material testing, but there may or may not be a bug with it. I'm waiting on an update on that. So in the meantime, we're going to talk about variable text and how to use it. It's pretty simple, so we'll just go ahead and get started here. First, we're going to create a little tiny serial number, very simple, just from scratch, so you guys can see how it's done. And then we're gonna spend the bulk of the time going over different ways it can be used. So the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is grab a piece of text and I'm gonna click on the page. In order to create a piece of variable text, in this case, a serial number, we'll want to type our variables. The variable for a serial number is D, so we can go ahead and type D. And depending on how many digits we want it to be, we can add more Ds. So if we want a three digit serial number, we can add three Ds. If we start our serial number at one and we want these other two Ds to be zeros, all we have to do is put a zero in front of it. And then anytime a zero comes up in one of these places, it will be auto filled with zero. If we don't put the zero, it's just gonna say one and there will be nothing before it. So we like the leading zeros. I'm, I'm a big fan of leading zeros. So we'll go ahead and put the zero in. And once that's done, we need to assign it a type of variable text. In order to do that, we're just gonna make sure that it is selected. And then we're gonna come up here to normal and we're gonna drop this down and we're looking for serial number. So we'll go ahead and click serial number. And we have a window over here by our cuts and layers called variable text. If you don't see this window, you can find it right up here in the window menu. And we'll just come down to variable text and just go ahead and make sure that that is checked, but uh, we have it. So we can go ahead and click that here. And all we need to do is put in our current, which is what we're going to see when we mark it, the starting number, which in this case will be zero, and the ending number, which we could say is 111. If we go ahead and hit test, it's gonna read zero because that's our current number. If I set our current number to 57 and we hit test, you can see we have that leading zero there and 57. If we hit next, it's gonna move us to 58 and we can hit test and there we go, 0, 058. If we hit reset, it's gonna set our count back to zero and you can hit test and there you can see it's zero. And we can also change the advance by number. So if we set this to five, it's gonna advance by five. So we can hit test and it's zero and then we'll hit next and test and it's five, next, test and it's 10, perfect. We have a couple other options here. We can auto advance. So every time that we hit the mark button and it marks something, it's going to hit the next button for us. So I would hit mark, it's gonna do 15. And then when the marking is done, it'll hit the next button for us automatically. And the next time we hit mark, it'll be 20. Uh, that's very useful. There's a lot of uses for that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We also have bake. So bake, if we want to set this number to 20 forever and we no longer want it to be variable, we can go ahead and hit bake and that's going to cook this into 20. So once this is 20, we can't press any more buttons. No matter what we do, if we reset, uh, we advance, we go back, uh, whatever, this is no longer affected. This is just normal text now. So um, be careful with that bake button because you might, you might mess something up that you didn't intend to mess up. Another reason you want to be careful with the variable text button is because if you hit bake, it's going to bake all of the variable text on the screen, not just the one that you have selected. So really be absolutely sure you want to hit this button before you hit it. You can always undo, but it could mess up a lot of hard work that you've put into setting things up for a job. So uh, just watch out for that. Uh, that is the basics on how to use the variable text window. I'm covering this first because we're going to talk about it a lot once we get into our different examples. We're going to get started with date and time here. This is probably the easiest one to understand, so I want to start with this first. In order to assign a string of text to date and time, we need to just select it and make sure we choose date and time from the dropdown. I've actually kind of prepared a variable text and result side by side for you so that it's a little bit easier to see and wrap your brain around. So we're gonna go take a look at that. So here guys, we can take a closer look at some of the variables included with the date and time variable text. Up top, we have the date. 
underneath we have the time and then I have some examples over here. We're gonna talk about all of it. But first, let's just talk about some date variables. So this goes for both date and time, but the more variables we use, the longer result we're gonna get. Here, you see we have four lowercase d's and that produces a full Wednesday. Three lowercase d's produces the shorthand Wednesday. Two lowercase d's produces a two digit calendar date and one lowercase d will produce a one digit calendar date if it can. So if this was the 12th instead of the seventh, it would still read one two with the one lowercase d because it requires two digits to show the full date. But for any dates that only require one digit, the lowercase d will only return the one digit. It's almost exactly the same for the month. Four capital M's produce September, three capital M's produce the shorthand for September, two capital M's produce the two digit calendar date for September 09, and one capital M produces the single digit date for the calendar if it can. So October, November, December are all gonna be two digit dates, 10, 11, and 12, but for all of the other months, one capital M will produce one digit calendar date. Similarly, the year, we have either the four digit year, 2022, or the two digit year, 22. Time functions very similarly, though there are a few little nuances that are important to understand. Two capital H's will produce a two digit in military time, so 14, 15, 1600 hours. One capital H will also produce military time, but if it can show one digit, it will. So for eight o'clock, nine o'clock, right, we would just have eight or nine, and that's uh, AM because it is military time, it's 24 hour time. Underneath that, the lowercase h's do the same exact thing. So here you can see two digits and one digit for 2 p.m., but it's only gonna show p.m. if we add either a or ap. If the am p.m. variable is not here, it will return military time. You can use either ap or a in order to produce an am p.m. result. And if you use lowercase letters, it will produce an am or p.m. in lowercase. And if you use capital letters, it will produce an am or p.m. in uppercase. Just like for everything else, mm here, lowercase, will produce a two-digit minute time, whereas a single m will produce a one-digit minute time if it can. ss will produce a two-digit second time, or a single s will produce a one-digit second time if it can. And triple z will produce a three-digit millisecond time, or a single z will produce a millisecond time with as few digits as possible. Quick note, we're losing a leading zero on seconds, and then there's a decimal point as we move into milliseconds, so we're losing a trailing zero down here with the milliseconds instead, so that is a little bit different. So let's look at some examples. Here we have a two-digit date, two-digit month, and two-digit year, 07, 09, 22. Here we've got a two-digit hour. Note they're capital H's and there is no AM or PM designator, so we're just getting 1,400 hours there. A two-digit minute, 16, and a two-digit second, 05. You can combine these if you like or use any mixture of them in order to produce strings of dates. So we've got the date over here on the left, a dividing line, and the time over here on the right. And I do just want to show you guys that it's important if we're going to include regular text that we put it in a pair of single quotes. That's because A is the variable for AM and PM and T, as we can see over here, is the variable for our time zone. And if we don't include this single pair of quotes here, it's actually going to produce something pretty messy. So uh, with the single quotes, it shows up as date, just like this with our day, month, and year. And let's pop over to Lightburn real quick to take a look at what happens if we don't actually include these single quotes. And just a quick demonstration here, guys. Like I mentioned, this AT is gonna cause a problem for us if date is not in those single pair of quotes. And that's because, again, the A is going to designate AM or PM, and the T is gonna designate the time zone. And because we don't have the quotes to tell Lightburn to ignore these two, it's going to definitely cause issues when we come into our variable text and try to test. So let's go ahead and hit the test button. And there you can see uh, AM, Eastern Daylight Time, uh, right smack in the middle of our date label. Uh, the one on the top continues to work. The one on the top functions perfectly. The quotes go away and we retain our date label. So there's just something you wanna keep an eye out for. And we'll do a couple more examples of this as we go along, but I really just wanted to show you guys how that can cause issues for you.
Next up is serial numbers. Same thing here. If we want to assign a string of text to a serial number, we just need to select that string of text, drop down from the list and make sure we're selecting serial number. Similarly to the date and time, I've prepared a graphic in advance to show you the variable text and the results side by side to make it a little easier to understand. So we will check that out now. Okay guys, let's take a closer look at serial numbers. So there's a lot on the page here and it's just to prove a point. It's just for example, it's not as complicated as it looks. So we have three basic variables for serial numbers. We have D, which stands for decimal, H, which stands for hexadecimal, and capital H, which stands for a hexadecimal that uses capital letters. For this test, we're assuming that our serial number we're trying to mark is one, two, three, four. Note that a single D does not produce the entire serial number like it would produce the entire date if needed with date and time. With serial numbers, we're telling Lightburn exactly how many digits to express. A single D means only the ones place is going to be expressed, where two Ds means that the ones and tens place will be expressed, three Ds, ones, tens, and hundreds, and four Ds, ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands. Note, as we add more Ds, we're not getting leading zeros. Those aren't automatic. In order to get leading zeros, we need to put a leading zero designator, and that's gonna be serial number padding. So here, same example, one D produces a four, two produces three, four, so on and so forth, until we get down to five Ds. Now notice, we have five digits here, but we only have a four digit serial number. Because we added the leading zero in ahead of that fifth digit, we're actually going to get a leading zero here. So it's gonna use all five of those digits. Same thing for six digits and seven digits too. You don't need to add a leading zero for every digit place that you want held. You just need to add one and then specify the number of digits you would like displayed. All of the same rules apply to hexadecimal values, though hexadecimal values are usually a bit shorter. So where one, two, three, four takes four digits to display over here with the decimal, it's only taking three digits to display over here with the hexadecimal. But all the same things apply. If you only put one H, you're only gonna get the ones place for hexadecimal. And if you place a leading zero in front of how many digits you would like shown, you will get that many zeros leading your hexadecimal value as a result. Lastly, the same rule applies with your pair of single quotes. And again, we'll pop over to Lightburn so that we can talk about this in a little bit more detail. Really quick, before we move on again, same thing as the date and time, the D in hardware is gonna cause an issue for us. So let's go ahead and get rid of those single quotes and I will show you guys what will happen if we don't use those appropriately. So because it's expecting a digit here and then we have a leading zero and a bunch of other non serial number characters in between and then more digits, it's going to throw an error actually. It, it won't work at all. So we have our current serial number set to one, two, three, four. And if we hit test up at the top, you can see our leading zero disappears because we only have four digits. Uh, but the bottom one, we get bad serial format. And again, that's just because we have a digit, then a leading zero, a bunch of random characters in between, and then four more digits. And Lightburn just doesn't know how to read that. So we get that bad serial format error. So especially with serial numbers, you really wanna make sure that you include that single pair of quotes. And once we do that and we run the test again, everything is gonna work exactly the way we expect it to. CSV merge is a little bit more complicated to follow. So I'm going to show you guys how to do that right here live in software rather than building a side by side. It'll just make more sense this way. CSV files take just a little tiny bit of extra setup. So not only do we need to come up to the top here and make sure we select merge slash CSV, but we also have to point it to the correct CSV file. So don't forget to do that. Otherwise this will not work. It's a simple browse menu. You can go ahead and click browse and navigate to wherever you keep your CSV file. I believe mine is in drive and here it is crash course right there, CSV, and we can open it up to link those together. I'm also going to go ahead and include the CSV file down below so that you guys can follow along with what I'm doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that up so I can see it. And we have a percent six here. So what percent six means is that we are the seventh, believe it or not, seventh in the Excel file, the seventh column over. We start at zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And that gives us this nice list of numbers here. 
This is great for serial numbers, especially ones where you kind of have a random list of serial numbers that don't really make sense or don't go in any particular order. Typically, large manufacturing clients, things like that, will just send you a list of random part numbers that are going on the same part over and over again. In situations like these, you can copy the numbers out of the email or whatever, paste it into a CSV file and tag the appropriate column. And what you get is this. So we'll go ahead and just see our percent six is right here. We can hit the test button and we get 147. That's the first number in our percent six column. Again, I'd like to point out that in Lightburn, the first one starts at zero, whereas in your spreadsheet application, the first row is likely starting at one. Both auto advance and the previous and next buttons work here, so we can hit next. It will move to one, which should take us to the second row in our CSV, and we can hit test. And we do, in fact, get 189. And you can test all the way through this, and it's going to pull up every number in the spreadsheet until you get to the end. And once you get to the end, it will actually generate nothing because that next cell is blank. Very handy, but we can take this a step further. You can do more than just decimals with this. We can actually do text as well. So in this example here, we've got world's best coach. Maybe we're doing tumblers or something. And you can see we have percent five and percent five is going to be our sixth column right here in the Excel file. So we actually have a list of names. If we reset our count to zero, we can hit the test button and we see the first name will come up. This is going to work exactly the same way, guys. So we can just go ahead and cycle through all of these names. And it's going to be very, very easy to get these tumblers done. We can take it even further, and this is probably the best utilization of this feature. So here we've got New York Parks Management offers its sincerest gratitude to percent three. We look at our CSV file and percent three is again, a list of names first and last for percent two years. Percent two in the CSV file is going to be how many years they worked at the company of dedicated commitment to, and percent zero is our list of cities. And then percent one is their specific park group. It's very, very easy to handle large numbers of orders where things are constantly changing, but the layout is the same by using the CSV merge. If we hit test, we can see Allison Stills worked for 25 years in the Schenectady Park Group 104. If we hit the next button, we'll see all of those fields change for us. Mary Roberts, 30 years, Rochester Park Group 107, and so on and so forth. And this makes manipulating large amounts of data very, very easy. When you're doing projects that require you to use the same template, but you have constantly changing data inside. And that about does it for the CSV merge. So we can go ahead and move on. Okay guys, last major section here, cut settings. Very easy to use cut settings. I just wanna point out before we get started that these are actually one line. So I can go ahead and hit the down arrow key here and we can move down this list. That's just because I've used line breaks to separate these out because it's a little bit easier to read, but it is one continuous string of text. The first item in our string of text is C11. And what this does is this tells Lightburn, I want you to produce the settings from this layer. So if we look over here, we can see C11 has a speed of 100 and a power of 20. And if we come into the variable text and we hit test, we can see a speed of 100 and a power of 20. So we know that that's working correctly. If you have a layer header in a string of text, it's going to produce the values that are kept within the listed layer. It does not matter what color the layer you're marking actually is, it's always gonna listen to that header. If you want it to produce values based on the color that it is, we can go ahead and delete these here and once that header is gone and we hit the test button, it's now producing different values. You can see 1500 millimeters per second. And in the cuts and layers panel, we can see our O2 layer right here, that's the red, is at 1500 millimeters per second. So now because there is no layer header, it's going to produce values based on the layer that it is assigned. Aside from that guys, writing this variable text is fairly straightforward. Lowercase letters simply produce the value being requested of it. We have speed, max power, minimum power, DPI, interval, Q pulse, and frequency. For the capital letters, everything else is exactly the same except they produce labels. So if we go ahead back to the test button and we hit that, you can see on the left with the lowercase letters, we're simply getting values. Whereas on the right with the uppercase letters, we're getting values with a label. 
Sometimes though, you might think the labels are a little too long, especially in the case of speed or power, which speed is a bit too long, power is a bit indescript. It's actually pretty easy to make our own labels. Over here we have C11 and S in a single pair of quotes. You guys should know by now, that means that we're going to keep our S and then the small s is just going to give us the value without the label. When I hit the test button and we take a look at that test, we can see we keep our s and we have the value 100. It's a nice way to add small shorthand labels so that you know what the setting is without having to rely on the ones built into Lightburn if you'd rather do something custom. The last thing I want to show you down here is that it is very important to make sure that we're using our pair of single quotes. If I try to label our speed with a regular S that doesn't have the quotes, it's going to give us the speed with the label and then the speed again rather than the S and the value we're looking for. So make sure if you're building short labels that happen to use any of these characters, and there are quite a few of them here that are common, to make sure that you're using those single pair of quotes so that everything is readable. Finally, I just wanted to take a second to talk to you guys about how we can combine different variable text elements. You'll notice this looks a little funky, and that's because we actually have two separate strings of text here. One of them has to be assigned to date and time, and one of them has to be assigned to serial number. But if we play our cards right, we can line these up to make one cohesive statement out of those two different strings of text. Here in quotes, we have M serial, just to show off the quote functionality and that it does in fact work. Maybe this stands for manufacturing serial or whatever. In some case, you may need to use this. And then we have a string for the date. We have a two digit day, a two digit month, and a two digit year. Next to that, we have a serial number. We have a leading zero and then three digit places. Let's say we're on part 23. We can go ahead and test that and we see 023, so we get to keep our leading zero there. And we have our date string. I have them weirdly overlapped like this because that's what I actually have to do in order to get them to turn out right. So if we go ahead and hit the test button, we can see we have a date and then our serial number and it does appear to be one cohesive string of text, which is certainly how it'll mark when the laser marks it. Depending on how you have the text aligned, we can go ahead and change the serial number to something like 123 and hit the test button and everything should line up correctly. It may take a little bit of work to get it just right, but you can build combination serial numbers out of multiple different types of variable text. There are some variable text elements that cannot be combined, at least not as far as I've been able to see. Up here we have our batch percent seven, and if we take a quick look at the Excel sheet, we'll see percent seven is a list of batch numbers. Let's say for the sake of argument that we need to assign three serial numbers to each batch number before changing the batch number. That's not actually possible. Let's set our current count to zero so that we make sure we're reading from the CSV file and hit test. And you can see we have our three digit serial number 000. Now if I want to advance that three digit serial number to 001 and we click next, not only is it going to advance the serial number, it's also going to advance our row for our CSV. If we hit test, you can see that the batch number has changed. We can go ahead and advance it a second time and hit test again, and the batch number once again has changed. This is really unfortunate. We should be able to control these separately for more complex variations on our variable text, but it is a problem that I've found. So just make sure that you're paying extra close attention when using multiple forms of variable text. Some of them will work great together, others will not. And that's about it for the basics of variable text, guys. Again, I will provide this file as well as the CSV file that goes along with the CSV section down in the description if you'd like to download this file and play around with it for yourself. I know that we covered a lot today and I was planning on actually covering barcodes and QR codes as well, but we're gonna have to save that for another episode. We also have Lightburn Camera coming up, so if that's something you're interested in, don't forget to keep an eye on the channel because we've got lots more Lightburn for Galvo tutorials coming your way. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Lightburn for Galvo Crash Course. If you got value out of this one, don't forget to smash the like button, let everybody else know the content is good, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you get notified the next time we add an episode to the Crash Course. If you need help with anything at all, there are links to our absolutely 100% free Discord and Facebook group down in the description, right next to the link to the Laser Master Academy, the number one way to support the channel. We absolutely love what we do here, guys, teaching you how to use your laser engraving machines, and we want to keep doing that. 
Every episode that we upload to the YouTube channel for everyone for free is thanks to our members over at the Laser Master Academy. If you want to sign up to support the channel, you can find out more over at masters.lasereverything.net. It starts at eight bucks a month. It comes with a bunch of bonus goodies for signing up and it's an awesome community over there. So I hope to see you over there soon. That's all I've got for this one, guys. Thank you so much for watching again, and I will see you in the next one.